welcome back to another episode of the nonprofit show everyone we are delighted to have you with us and we are going to demystify planned giving today sherry are you going to be I, you you know all of this but are you going to help us figure this out with Tony? Well, I will tell you, I know enough to be dangerous, but I do call on this guy often when my clients have a question on this. So we have, we have the right person in the room today, Julia. I love it. Well, Tony, welcome. We are really excited to learn from you today. This is one of these topics that um, are really, it really needs to be had and it's not that simple. And so let's get going and really have you help us understand what we need to be doing so that this isn't such a mystery. Another thing that's not a mystery any day on the nonprofit show, and that's our amazing and profound presenting sponsors. They include Blue Meringue, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. I am Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Here today, I'm joined by the amazing Sherry Quam Taylor, CEO of Quam Taylor. Um, Sherry is one of our illustrious co-hosts. Um, our panel comprises folks and experts from around the country. Tell us where you're coming to us from, Ms. Sherry. Uh, I, I'm I'm in Chicago land, and I I was going to complain about the heat, but then you you. Uh... You, you got that one with whatever you said it was in in Arizona, so I don't win. But uh, but hello from the Midwest. Yeah. Well, Tony, where are you coming to us from? I'm on a beach in North Carolina. Oh, I know, oh. I know. Okay, you win because that's where we want to be. We need to bring our show, um, Tony, to to you, and we need to do a remote. So, Tony Marnetti. Did I say that correctly? You absolutely did. Yes. Okay. Principal of Tony Marnetti com .com. Tell me, tell us about your work because you're an attorney. So you come to this ecosystem with a different lens. Start us off with that, Tony, so we can really understand this journey that we're going to take with you today. Well, Julia, thank you very much for hosting me. I'm, I'm honored to be on my first appearance. Uh, yeah. on, the, on, the, on the show. Thank you very much for hosting. Um, yeah, I used to be an attorney, but I hated it. Uh, found it to be a very unpleasant way to make a lot of money. And I re-engineered myself first as a frontline planned giving fundraiser. I was at a college and then a university. And then I began planned giving consulting in 2003. But my, my work in planned giving started in 1997. Amazing. Have you seen the concept change and, and the structures change? I mean, because it seems to me and Sherry, tell me what you think. We don't talk about this enough. Mm -hmm. or, or in a passing way, maybe. But, uh, you know, yeah. yeah, I'd be curious to know if you if the conversation has changed. Um, you know, the beauty of planned giving fundraising is that it does not change that much. Uh, it, it would take a major overhaul of the uh, estate tax law for planned giving fundraising to change significantly. And there hasn't been one of those in uh, at least two decades. Um, and when you're focusing on the right kind of gift for launching planned giving, which I'm sure we're gonna get a chance to talk about, gifts in wills, that never changes, never mm -hmm. changes. So, so for somebody who's not too bright like me, it's, it's the ideal field. There's not a lot of relearning, to, not a lot of the education you need to do. So help us out and, and let's start from the basic. What is planned giving and why should we do this? Like, why should we say this is going to be a strategy that we take? Yeah, that's a per perfect place to start, Julia. Um, it's long term giving to your nonprofit. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm talking to the audience. So I'm thinking that these folks are with us because they're fundraisers. They don't really understand what planned giving is. Yeah. They've heard about it, but it sounds too technical. It's a black box. It's a death conversation. 
Uh, all of those things are untrue. It's planned giving when done right is very simple at launching. Uh, we're dealing with the most basic, simplest, most common, most common planned gift by far, gifts and wills. That's the place to launch your planned giving. Um, you do want to understand that it's long-term giving because a gift in a donor's will won't be cash to your nonprofit until the donor has it. So it's long-term giving. It's not going to fund the five-year capital plan or anything like that. So you need to be devoted, you and your board, to, uh, to long-term fundraising. Mm -hmm. And the reason to do it, sustainability, endowment, either endowment launch or endowment growth. Mm -hmm. Most of the planned gifts by far, I would say, and I've been doing this for 27 years, I'd say 90% of the planned gifts I've seen, simple gifts in wills uh, being the most common again, are unrestricted. Yeah. And uh, as the evangelist for planned giving, I encourage charities that I'm working with to put as much of that unrestricted money as possible into endowment. I, I know there are immediate concerns that sometimes just absolutely have to be met. That's why I say as much as possible, stretch, put that money as much as you can when those unreal, un, unrestricted gifts come into your endowment and that of course, feeds your sustainability. Julia, I think uh, the reason Tony and I uh, have headed off for, for so many years now, I, I'd be afraid to go back and count, um, <laughs> is really because our work kind of sits beside each other in a way that um, you have to have a deep relationship with your donors so that this is a really comfortable conversation, um, that it's just an extension of, uh, you know, your real relationship with your donor, that, that it's a natural uh, lead in when the time is right to have that conversation. And I think that's what's been so great uh, just to just to learn about this work of it really doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be like Tony always says, a death conversation. It really is a natural extension of a relationship, um, which then uh, and then I love Tony. Um, like sometimes people will say to me, should I do annual fund or endowment or should I do this or this? And I say, well, you need both. Um, and actually, you probably know the stat, Tony, uh, or I'll ask you about it. Um, he has shown me that um, when people give a planned gift to your organization, it actually grows the annual fund giving, which I'm all about. Tony, do you have that stat or do, can you talk to that? 75%. Uh, 75%. On average, 75% of people who leave a gift in their will, again, we're talking about the simplest, most common the place to launch your planned giving, simple gifts and wills. 75% of the folks who do that will increase their other giving to your nonprofit. And why is why is that? Because you're, you're spot on, uh, Sherry. That's because they feel so close to you. Because what have they done? They've put your work, your mission, your values right alongside their the, the donor's husband, wife, partner, children, grandchildren, right alongside those dear loved ones, there's a gift for your work. And that's They feel so much closer to you that uh, on average, as I said, 75% of the folks who do it will increase their other giving to your nonprofit. That is incredibly profound and something I have never heard before. But, you know, when you explained it and we, we talk about our prospects and, and who we're working with, it makes so much sense because it is um, a part of your legacy that you're communicating, as you said, next to your loved ones, your, you know, your, your, your family interests. And you're saying, no, this, this means something to me. And so this is where I'm going with that. Talk to us about that uncomfortableness in terms of, you know, it's not, as you said, the death conversation, but who should we be looking at for our prospects? I mean, not everybody lives to the ripe old age and then it's, it's you know, a, a phase of gifting. I mean, things happen and, and lives change. So how do we figure out who our prospects should be when creating this strategy and then subsequently having the conversation? That's a great question, Julia, because you do want to be talking to the right folks. And just first, 
it's not a conversation about death because it's a conversation about life. The life of your nonprofit. How important your work is in your community. However you define community. It might be a local community. It might be a county, state, province, if you're with us from Canada. It might be the globe. However you define community, how important your work is to that community and that that work must continue for decades and generations to come. So we're talking about the sustainability of your work, the life of your nonprofit. So it's not at all a death conversation. It's a conversation about life. Let me jump in and ask you a question that just like popped into my head. And Sherry, I would love to get your feedback on this as well. And that is, do you have, um, if you will, like a team or an expert within a development group that is going to lead these conversations? Or do you advocate training up everybody um, who has, you know, a portfolio and engagement to have this conversation? Like, what does that look like? Any nonprofit that has individual donors. So, you know, if, if you're strictly event or grant uh, and or fee for service funded, you, you won't have a, you don't have a platform, you don't have a constituency to talk about planned giving with. But if you're diversified in your fundraising, as Sherry, Sherry. routinely preaches, <laughs> and you have, so then you have, a, you have individual donors, and again, not event, we're not talking about event attendee, we're talking about folks who give out of their own pocket without a quid pro quo, without a, without a meal in front of them. When you have those kinds of individuals, uh, individual donors, then you can you can talk to folks about planned giving, and you want to be talking to your most loyal, committed donors. Those are your prospects for a gift in a will. Your most loyal, committed, long-term donors, and there's not a lot of training up that's needed, Julia, because we're talking about wills, and for the vast majority of adults. And in the U.S., and meaning your donors, yeah. everybody knows what a will is. Yeah. Everybody knows how wills work. And everybody knows that they need to have a will. So those three things are in your favor. You don't have to train up your staff because those three things are true of your staff and your, your fundraisers. And you don't have to spend precious marketing dollars and time educating your donors because those three features of wills are understood almost universally among your donors. So there's not a lot of training needed. We can go out and start talking to our most loyal committed donors. Today's Thursday, um, you know, take the weekend, uh, take tomorrow to think about it, weekend off. Uh, I'd say Monday, just query, find those committed long-term donors, launch your plan giving next Tuesday. So good. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add to that, um, would be that uh, your staff has to be having conversations with donors. And that sounds really maybe a little bit crazy, but I find so often that so many of our fundraisers are tied up behind the computer, sending emails and, and, and doing campaigns and appeals and aren't really leaning into those one-on-one -on -one conversations and building relationships. And so if you're doing that, or if they need training to do that, then the plan giving conversation is so simple and you can roll right into it. But you have to be, uh, that fundraiser who goes and talks uh, to humans, right? Sitting down with them, having coffee, getting to know them, and really leaning into that, those relational skills. And then this is this is easy. Uh, I love that. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tony. Go ahead. I'm just I'm seconding what what Sherry routinely <laughs> advocates that you unburden your fundraisers or yourself if you are the fundraiser, or yourself if you are the CEO. Mm -hmm. From you, you've got to. I'm going to steal Julia's. Uh, I'm going to steal Julia's lines now. She's going to be upset with me. Uh, so credit to Julia. Uh, I mean Sherry. Uh, credit to Sherry Quam Taylor for what I'm about to say. Quote: You need to align your hours with your dollars. End quote. So yeah. unburden yourself if that's if you're the fundraiser. Unburden your fundraisers if you they're on your team from administrative tasks that are keeping them from one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. ideally face-to-face, -face, but maybe not face-to-face, 
uh, personal, individual conversations with folks. Phones work great for older folks. They folks in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. They're probably not going to zoom with you. That, that's figuring that out is reserved for their grandchildren. But they'll have a phone conversation with you because they grew up on the phone. Or they'll have an exchange with you by handwritten notes because they also grew up with handwritten notes, especially when you're talking to folks about 70 and above. Yeah. So you 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 know stop being burdened by designing the four color planned giving brochure. You don't need it. You don't uh, need a four color, three panel, that's four the color take away. brochure. Oh, it's just a minute. Wait, no, the yellows are off. Yeah. Every second you start, you spend thinking about the yellows and the, and the borders and the text of your three panel, four color brochure. That's a, that's a second that you're not spending in a face-to-face -face or personal conversation with donors about their, their investment in your work. So uh, you have a whole soapbox about events and making sure that the bunting matches the flowers. You'll, you'll net so much more than you will making sure that everything is color coordinated in the gala room. If you would just devote those hundreds of hours that you spend making sure that the bunting matches the flowers instead talking to individual donors about their investment level gifts, the gifts and wills for your work. I love okay, it. Sherry, Sherry, I love, I, I'm, I'm watching you here on the screen and I'm just loving this. How hard, when? because I know you train fundraisers and you coach folks with this conversation and, 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 and many others, but around this, how hard is it to communicate these things that Tony is saying because Tony's bringing it back to the cause selling relationship piece of this as opposed to the marketing piece of this. Yeah. What are you yeah. hearing? Well, I find that Julia, the whole sector tells us to pivot into these very transactional activities. Like if you Google anything, how do I raise more funds? Popcorn sales comes up, you know, like events, 5k, like that's what 95% of the content is. Um, but so like, you know, I think Tony and I like just kind of our, our work is so, you know, aligned because we have to go to the numbers. And if we want our hours to align with dollars, it's always the relational activities that yield the highest dollars. And so it's, it's kind of funny to me sometimes when people are like, oh, well, that makes sense. I never thought of it that way. It's like, you know, it's it just feels very practical to me. Um, and when people start doing that, um, you know, and shifting maybe some of these transactional activities into relational activities, it is bonkers the, the, the results they get. And it's like, oh, why haven't we been doing this all along? So I think it is just this invisible script in the sector of like, that's what fundraising is, but that should only be about 25% of your revenue. The 50 to 75% should be through relationships like we're talking about today. You know, I always think of the Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland approach, I call it, to fundraising. And that's like, my dad's got a barn, let's put on a show. <laughs> and and think about this is an old trope that we have. We have to get people, and I'll say it, liquored up. We have to entertain them. We have to kind of cajole them. And it is obviously um, not sustainable versus having that face-to-face. So I'm fascinated by the, the the return to something that's so basic, but that is is really a structural approach. Yeah. Tony, when you talk to people and you're advising them on this, how do you paint the picture of the future? I mean, we're talking about prospects, but what does this look like in terms of the, the length of time? How do we plan? I mean, how do we kind of figure this out? so that, that we know we're doing the right thing because it's not immediate, right? Right. The, the, the cash is not going to be immediate. Again, you know, it's, it's going to be cash to your nonprofit at the donor's death when we're talking about gifts and wills mm -hmm. and, and most planned gifts. But I focus on the gifts and wills because that's the place to launch your planned giving. They're the most common gift by far. Expect your, your, all your planned gifts over the decades that I hope you'll be doing planned giving fundraising, you're going to find a minimum 75% of the gifts 
are going to be gifts and wills. And I've seen it as high as 90% mm -hmm. in, in lots of lots of nonprofits that I've worked with. So you know, the most common planned gift by far, but it is long-term given. You're, you're right about that, Julia. Um, so, you know, you're, you're painting a picture of the importance of your work in the community. And when you're talking to the right donors, those long-term, loyal, committed donors, they care about that. Right. If you're sending this message by direct mail, your mail is not junk mail to the to these folks. Yeah. It might be for other, it might be for other cadres or other constituents you may have, but for your long-term committed donors, it's not. And the message resonates, however you deliver it, that your work is important because people you're talking to have been supporting it for decades in some cases. I, I've seen giving histories that go back. 40 years and over 40 years you might see 50 or 60 gifts because there's multiple gifts in some years right. and but i i want to hasten to add if your nonprofit has only been around for 10 years you have long-term committed donors yeah they just haven't been giving to you for 40 years because you haven't been around that long so you have folks who've been giving to you for seven eight ten years still loyal yeah, some of them have given 12 or 15 gifts in those seven eight or ten years those are your long-term committed donors you want to be talking to about gifts and wills. So let me ask you this before we go on to our next question. And when we're talking about prospects, um, do you feel that a, a nonprofit has to reach a certain threshold in either budget or, you know, age in order to have these conversations? How do, how do we look at this in terms of the, the maturation process of our nonprofit? I like to see a nonprofit that's at least five years old. Okay. Because we do have to overcome the concern that donors are going to have that our nonprofit won't survive them, mm. right? Yeah. That the nonprofit will end before th this gift can come to maturity. So uh, I like to see at least five years and some depth in staff, you know, not just a founder. Okay. A founder and ideally two or more people. Okay. If, if it's that young an organization, again, okay. trying to overcome the concern about yep. the longevity of the of the nonprofit. So at least five years and founder plus two, as a minimum. Budget size? No, I'm not not concerned about budget. I've worked with a, I, I worked successfully with a little historical agency with a two hundred fifty thousand dollar a year budget, and just one full time employee, but it was not the founder. And the agent and the this agency had a long uh, long history. They had they had been around for I think thirty years. So, uh, but just one full time employee, and they had very good results from a first mailing we did. I love it. So this has been a fascinating conversation. We don't have a lot of time left with you, but you said something that was like kind of shocking to me because I'm thinking, you know, to get started, you gotta have you gotta meet with an attorney that's going to represent your organization and you got to get the right paperwork and all of that. And I, I hear you giving us a different message saying, get started with the relationships first. Is that correct? Absolutely, Julia. It, you, you have it, you have it spot on. It, it, it's 180 degrees from the common misconceptions that we need to have a lawyer on the board. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I, I don't practice law, but I, I'm probably the only one who will tell you, you don't need a lawyer. It's just not necessary because you're, you're simplifying planned giving by launching. And you may, you may be doing the same thing in planned giving 20 years from now. This is, this is going to your, your question I see on the screen. How do we get started? We get started with gifts and wills. And 20 years from now, you might still only be promoting gifts and wills. And you will have an enormously successful, robust, appropriate, planned giving program 20 years from now, and all you ever did was promote the simplest gift, but the most common planned gift, mm -hmm. gifts and wills. Mm -hmm. The place to start is plan is gifts and wills. And if you want to go beyond those, yeah, there are other valuable types of gifts, charitable mm -hmm. trusts and charitable annuities, sure, life insurance, but you don't need to. You don't ever need to broaden to those other types of gifts you can stick you, you ought to start with gifts and wills and you can stick with those for the duration of your 
planned giving fundraising. Apparently everyone's starting on Tuesday. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, Tuesday. Well, give some folks, you know, they might they might take a long weekend, maybe Wednesday. That's fair, it's summer. They, they might take a Monday off. I love it. You know, um, Sherry, in your practice and, and how you communicate and train and and lead people to this discussion, do you favor like certain uh, nomenclature, certain phrases, certain ways, steps? Like, what does this look like? You can't just email somebody, hey, will you put us in your will? What would you advise on this process? Yeah, I mean, I, my, you know, my methodology, you've probably heard me say is really leading donors on a journey so that when the time is right, which might be six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, we are asking for their best gift. And then we're actually asking them for that gift every year. And so if you're in that cadence where some people you're meeting with three times a year, four times a year, six times a year, it really is a natural extension to say, hey, Next time we meet, would you be open to talking about just how you might um, or your your long term giving plans? Would you would that be something you'd be okay sharing with me? Or you know, Tony probably has a phrase, but like it really is just a natural extension. And someone's going to say, yeah, yeah, we, I can talk about that. Or um, it's it's kind of like no big deal if if I can say it that way. But you have to be in that cadence so that it's just natural. Um, it's not an elephant in the room. It's just, it's, it just is there. You're already talking finances. You're already talking about investment level gifts. You're already soliciting mm -hmm. gifts. If you're, if you're soliciting, so many people don't solicit and mail things. We got to ask for their best right. gift. Right. It's really just another conversation. Yeah. It, I, I hear the word, the word coming to my mind is habit. Mm. It almost is like you get into the habit it's of rhythm. thinking this. Yeah, I, I love you use the word cadence. It's like, yeah. this is how we communicate. This is what we say. Um, we are worthy of this type of a gift. We are worthy of this conversation in our with our organization. Um, and so, yeah, really, really interesting things. Wow, Tony, I, I, I'm not going to look at, you know, next week the same way. I'm going to think about Tuesday when when the show starts and I'm going to be like, this is, this is our, you know, planned giving day. We need to be starting this and uh, really, really interesting conversation. I love your approach and I love the, the simplistic end of the fear wagon, right? We can only do this. Like you said, when the bunting matches the flowers, uh, which was hilarious, sadly, very true. So um, Tony Martinetti, Loved having you on today and another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Check out Tony's website, TonyMartinetti.com, and you can learn a lot about what he does and how he does it. Tony, you have your own podcast. Is that correct? I do, Julia. Thank you. Tony Martinetti Nonprofit Radio. Sherry has been on several times. We talk about everything that small and mid-sized nonprofits struggle with. So it's not just planned giving by any stretch. Experts right. like Sherry come on and share their wisdom. Uh, and it's not just fundraising. Uh, lots of board topics, legal topics, everything for small and mid-sized shops. And uh, Julia, thank you so much for hosting. It's really, it's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, I'm thrilled that you've been on with Sherry and I. Um, this is just such an important topic and such a um, a great way. I mean, we, we, we titled this Demystifying, you know, planned giving, but it's really, um, I think it's breaking down some barriers that we put upon ourselves so that we don't do something, right? Yeah. And so that's what I really liked about this. It's like, get get moving forward and don't just keep coming up with things um, to to make it something that goes down the road. And you're, you don't want to kick that can down the road. Um, another thing that we are so grateful for along with Tony and Sherry today, um, are our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraising Academy, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. They are with us day in and day out so we can have these amazing conversations. As we end every episode of The Nonprofit Show, we like to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, even our guests and co-hosts, and that is to stay well so you can do well.
Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Sherry.